And we're live. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is the Reinventing the Tattoo community. We are beaming out. Uh, today is Art History Talk with Travis Louie, uh, an amazing oh, oh shit, illustrator, artist, teacher, uh, all sorts of... He's amazing. We've been following his uh, Facebook. It's one of the few times I can get on Facebook and, and walk away happy and satisfied. He's always posting up amazing art and movies, inspirations. He's an art history teacher. Anyways, it's going to be an amazing show. Thank you very much for watching. Um, I'm going to be testing this out we're streaming out on uh, on the facebook's on the youtubes and again primarily through the reinventing the tattoo community so while uh I'm, we're, this is going out through the internets i'm going to do a little bit of testing to make sure and i also want to talk a little bit about our other upcoming events because we are beaming out uh like five times a, a week now um, okay so obviously this is our art talk with travis louis this is the first uh, art history talk that we're doing on the channel we're exceptionally excited um other other streams that we have coming up uh every thursday at 12 noon we have the tattoo collecting podcast with uh fawn and jordan they talk to ta serious tattoo collectors every time I, I say this all the time but whenever i get the pictures they blow me away the, the collectors that they're uh, interviewing are amazing so whether you're just interested in tattoos or even if you're actually a tattooer uh, who's interested in hearing a, a seasoned tattoo collectors uh, experiences uh 12 noon every thursday we have reinventing drawing groups uh, two times a week now, at least. We have one on one o'clock on Sunday afternoons. All these times are Eastern. Um, one o'clock on Sunday afternoon, uh, we have uh, the drawing group with Jason Lesser. And then on Monday mornings at nine o'clock with Jake Meeks from the Fireside Tattoo Networks. It is an amazing way to start off your Monday mornings. I mean, I, I'm racing around. I'm not even showering. I put my hat on, we hop on, but then we go through a, a art first thing in the morning and it's a, an amazing way to start the day. Uh, at noon on Mondays, we have Let's Talk Tattoo with Mark Lascarbo from Needle Jig. And then every Monday night, we have subscriber uh, exercises with Guy Aitchison via the Reinventing the Tattoo Canon. Uh, this is the actual subscription is how we, uh, we, we charge admission for it, but uh, it's amazing. It's not only uh, like 350, 400 pages. I mean, they're not pages anymore. It used to be three or 400, 350 pages. Now it's this massive online course. It's got dozens of videos. Uh, and every Monday, everyone gets together as a group and does uh, art exercises based off of the curriculum. So uh, it's definitely worth subscribing. Um, if you enjoy these kinds of things. Okay, then we also have, let's see, uh, digital editing for inkjet stencils is going to be a demo that's on uh, Wednesday the 27th. We've got Nick Baxter is doing a still life coming up January 31st. Point being, there's so many events going on, I can't actually list them all. Uh, so head on over to the Reinventing the Tattoo app in either the app stores, or you can go straight there, community.reinventingthetattoo.com. And the events uh, link is the first one that you'll see and if you've missed any of these uh or you know you've missed a ton of them i've missed a ton of, i haven't missed any to see the replays go to the app click on library uh video library and all of the shows are there forever so no matter when you're watching this um you can check out the replays um anything else here uh i'm going to stop oh inkjet stencils is the sponsor for this show and yeah, you should definitely check out either inkjetstencils.com or you can go to their uh, folder inside of the app. It's uh, at the very bottom of the main menu. And they've got an amazing technology. They uh, you manipulate your uh, reference on the, on the computer or on the iPad, and then you print out a stencil. It, it prints out the stencil. Uh, Andre Malcolm is doing full back pieces and sleeves pretty regularly with, uh, with the system now. So if you're either in the app or you're on Instagram, check out Andre Malcolm. Uh, Andre Malcolm Tattoo, if you do a search for him, he does amazing large-scale Japanese work, and he's printing out his stencils all in one shot. Okay, I am going to fall into the background now. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, uh, leave them into the, in the chat rooms, and I will try to answer if there's ever a lull or, or at the end. And uh, I'll be here to fix any problems or to pull up some of these amazing artists that uh, we'll be talking about. So take it away, Guy. All right. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. This is going to be a, a really interesting talk. It's the first in our uh, ongoing series of art history talks because I think a lot of uh, artists get into tattooing without a lot of uh, knowledge of art history and kind of learn about it in a haphazard way. I mean, I know that I kind of did. And so it's kind of nice when people share their influences and in the, the artists, especially people who aren't part of tattooing uh, that shaped uh, who they are and how their style 
you know, uh, evolved into what it is. Um, you know, my own influences, I know, you know, starting at early childhood included a lot of the classic greats, you know, Da Vinci, Rembrandt, uh, Van Gogh, and uh, eventually Max Ernst, who uh, did these incredible organic abstractions, which if you saw those and you see my paintings, you say, aha, all right, that's where some of that came from. Um, there are other artists who uh, regularly post their influences. Uh, Gunner, uh, who you'll find on Instagram as Art of Gunner. He will be joining us in two weeks, uh, one, week, one day shy of two weeks, on Tuesday uh, the 2nd of uh, February for another art history talk. And he's posted a lot of really great images of pieces from art museums with his uh, brief captions uh, about them. And, and this stuff is fascinating. It really is worth learning about what some of these artists went through uh, what it was like at the time in society to be an artist, you know, hundreds of years ago, it, it, was, it was a little bit harder. Uh, some of the artists like Rembrandt and uh, Monet were flat broke, you know, far broker than, you know, a lot of us tattooers are, uh, even being as great as they are. So anyway, today we've got Mr. Travis Louie joining us. Some of you may have heard of Travis's name uh, first through Juxtapose magazine, uh, and uh, many of you are going to see his work and say, ah, that guy, even if you don't know his name, I'm sure you've seen his work. Uh, he was sort of, uh, he came, it became known as a result of his tiny little matchbook portraits, which are, you know, incredible, very meticulous and, uh, and flawlessly executed with this, this great sort of quirky style to it. Uh, thank you, Travis, for joining us today. Um, I'm... Uh, I'm curious to hear a little bit about uh, your history as an artist, uh, where you started out, uh, what your early learning experience was, uh, your education, all that stuff. In fact, I'm not even sure where to begin, but uh, thank you, Travis, for joining us. Sure. Uh, just, just. Aha! You know, that is a guy named Jason DeQuino. I don't know if you know him. Also, he actually is a tattoo artist. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. The matchbook thing. I, I, I'm sorry. I made that mistake. Uh, uh, oh, just, you know, I, I, I knew just, that. I knew that. In fact, <laughs> in the back of my head, I, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, do you know Jason personally? I, I, I did know him. Uh, I, I, you know, on and off, you know, just for circles, you know, we just kind of, people just kind of lose touch. Uh, in fact, uh, sadly, one of the, my friends that I lost touch with uh, passed away yesterday. His name is Van Arno. I don't know who that is. Oh, yeah, yeah, Van Arno. Yeah, he was incredible. I did not know that we had just lost him yesterday. He just that's passed terrible. away yesterday, or at least that's what I heard this morning. Uh -huh. um, you know, I'm sad I, I didn't get to uh, talk to him again. I was just getting ready to call him, you know, and reach out to him because I hadn't heard from him in a little while. I like to keep in touch with all of my friends. You know, it's um, it's kind of it's kind of funny, you know, uh, there used to be more of a community when we all had shows and we were all traveling out to, to the West Coast. But now with the pandemic thing, it's kind of slowed things down a bit. Uh, so a lot of us aren't traveling to shows. I mean, are you are you still doing, are there even, have there ever been? Condemned? You know, there might be a few, but I'm not sure I'd even be comfortable going right now. And and uh, yeah, I mean, just in general, the, the sense of community in the tattoo world has been a lot harder to maintain. Uh, yeah. We've tried to do these online things a bit and, and we, you know, like, like in Gabe's description, we've got some where we actually get together and there'll be a group of a dozen of us, you know, zooming together and just working on our drawings and commenting on each other's stuff. And, you know, it's, it's really nice. It's not the same as being in person though. And, uh, right. Yeah. But it, it's, it's funny that, that a lot of the artists that I, I, I grew up looking at, um, at least the ones that are working in the profession that I wanted to be in, I got to meet them later because of conventions. Like you would go to like Comic-Con or something and these guys would just be there. And that was kind of cool, you know? So somebody that whose work, you know, like a guy like uh, William Stout, I don't know if you know who that is. He had done, he's done a lot of work, a lot of the dinosaur paintings uh, recently. Okay. Uh, gosh, he, he, did, he did some concept work for the movie The Return of the Living Dead, those drawings of the zombies, those are his. But I didn't get to meet yeah. them. I didn't get to oh, meet yeah. so There were conventions, and I could go to a convention. And there he is, and and he's yeah, there. Yeah, that piece from Wizards. I know that piece. Yeah, and that, that guy's work is wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. or uh, or Mike Kaluta. You know, or uh, 
any anybody from that old studio. I don't know if you remember um, uh, Jeffrey Jones, and uh, well, I, actually, he he became Jeffrey. Is it Catherine Jeffrey Jones or Jeffrey Catherine Jones? I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, but he had, he had switched genders at some point uh, before he passed, and uh, so it was it was him. It was Mike Kaluta, and it was uh, Bernie Wrightson. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. He's really crazy, Frank. This crazy Frankenstein. Uh, I don't know if you've probably seen it. Uh, and then yeah, yeah. In fact, there's there's been a, uh, a a few people I know who've posted images of some of those Frankenstein pieces. I, I know that that uh, Gunner had posted one, and uh, somebody the other day, it's on the top of the back of my head, but uh, yeah, I've, I've actually spent a bit of time staring at those images recently because some oh, of I, I love that stuff. I, I really, you know, it's remarkable. Yeah, it's uh, such a, a foundation for many of, of people within, you know, not, not just the tattoo world, but would you consider your genre or subgenre the lowbrow art world or what would you call it? I, I really don't know what to call it now. I know the, the root of it, uh, going, going down to the West Coast. Uh, out to the West Coast, uh, you know, it was, I guess they called it lowbrow at first, you know, but then, it, but it, it, it's, it's not really so easy to, to, to uh, give it a, give it a, a, I guess it's, it's easier to just call it that, right? Yeah. Um, talking like uh, uh, a guy like Mark Ryden and XNO and uh, guys like that, you know, that showed up. Yeah. Uh, 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 Todd Shore, I don't know if you're familiar with Todd Shore's work. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, Eric White. You know, those were the guys, and they 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 kind of called it pop surrealism at some point, probably around okay. 2002, 2003. They they that's what they called themselves for a little while, you know. Uh, but you know, it's I, I I would like to think of it as just there were, there was this time that there were a bunch of these artists that that, that were on the West Coast, and they were, and they were they were displaying these paintings, and they got some 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 traction, some popularity, and it, it went from there. Some of them right, but that around. moment that moment had that name, but yeah. yeah, genres, names of genres are really just words. Exactly. Uh, there, there, you know, there was the there was the two hot rod guys, but there was Keith Wiesner, right? I, you know, and then of mm -hmm. course the big guy, that's uh, Robert Williams, right? Yes, that was the big guy. Uh, again, all around that time, and then the connection, of course, goes back to like I don't know, like like the '60s and the '50s, and you have like Zap Comics, and you know. And, you have uh, who's the guy that did uh, Rat Fink? Remember Rat Fink? Yeah, uh, Ed Roth. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ed Roth right? or Big Big Daddy yeah. Roth. Uh, Big Daddy Roth, you know. So yeah. without him, this stuff doesn't exist. Pretty much, right? It's, kind right. Of, it's true. It, there there actually were there were a few of the right? you know. Now we're going back in time a little bit. We're talking about the Zap comics. So of course, of course you've got Robert Crumb. Uh, right. who's amazingly prolific and, and his his work kind of pushed out into the mainstream a little bit not because he became mainstream but just because it's so damn good right oh yeah and then uh then of course you've got greg irons who uh became a tattoo artist and you know sadly uh was was hit by a bus in thailand uh but yeah his his zap comics were especially trippy uh rick griffin uh yeah i think Griffin's work was was very influential in skateboard art, uh, particularly uh, in graffiti art. Uh, you know, you had uh, oh, Checker Demon. Oh man, what was that guy's name? Um, oh, the Checker Demon know. guy. Oh. There was uh, there was a guy before that is uh, Basil Wolverton. Oh uh, yeah. Okay, so now we're going back even farther. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, I no, love no, that. This is great. I love it so, yeah, so, he was he was an influence on them. Yeah, uh, and then you know, then then you have um, uh, this, you know, they 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 were all a lot of these guys really loved like horror movies, so they were buying like famous monsters of film land that Fori Ackerman magazine, and so there's okay. a little bit of that in the paintings, like really yep. not short paintings, a little bit, not like it's it's with those guys, and I guess with me as well, it's 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 essentially what we grew up with and our ephemera, what the kind of things we looked at, and that's what shows up in the paintings. Look at these Todd Shore paintings, just like this, like Fred Flintstone, and this like King Kong, you know, and, the, and these these are beautiful, beautiful paintings. You know? Right. Oh, they're they're stunning. 
Yeah. You know? but, but this is the stuff you grew up looking at. And it's just because we're, we're like filters and we absorb all the sensory information and then we just kick out our version of it or, or just uh, or, or what what it, 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 it uh, connects to us, what we, you know. Right, right. Because uh, as kids, you know, let's say you've right. got a particular action figure that you love. It's not just going to be because of the show and you like the show, but there's going to be the way that you connected with it. The character in the show, you like them because, you know, maybe maybe it reminds you of your dad and it's something really positive about your dad and then that becomes you know something about fatherhood and and this this broad sort of cultural view of fatherhood and then looking at it through this filter and before you know it you've done a painting about you know this broad cultural view of fatherhood but it's an action figure right yeah but because it's filtered that way you know through that experience that's that's the filtering process so, I mean, with, with my work, uh, it's a combination of all these things that I looked at. And then, of course, uh, my, my connection to the, the, the immigration experience, right? So a lot of my earlier paintings were all about um, people coming here. So it was always these old, they, look, they would look like 19th century photographs, but they're, they're monsters and they're, you know, sometimes they're animals, sometimes they're these mythical creatures, but they're wearing suits and they're, they're pose. Like, like an old cabinet. Very office. formal, yes. Yeah. And that's that that's because I I I wanted to be able to show this kind of um well it it's it's kind of my, my, my veiled commentary on on, on on the immigration experience, right? But without actually showing people that are from Europe or from other countries, but I'll just make these make up these sort of uh, monsterish people, right? Um like uh like the strangler is one of them. Right, uh, and then this is kind of what I'm doing now is this kind of stuff, which is more uh, these animals. Uh, but you know, yeah, they've got so much all, attitude. You know, uh, I, I like the idea of, of of people making really interesting discoveries. Like this guy discovered this this yeti, you know, uh, you know, this giant monster, but he's so big he doesn't fit the frame. You know, right? No, I love the crop. So, you know, there's clearly a period attached to these uh what is the attraction to that period is it you know, you know partly because of this idea of the immigration experience and the historic view of that and, and also because there, there, there was a there was a moment when someone took a photograph and said well it must be true it's a photograph right not today of course not so much but uh there were there were these two little girls that faked fairy photographs you know i remember story. that yeah right and it's because they they could use photography and they made these little cu cutouts and they were just really good at it you know and which that which is a, a real trick because back then of course when you take a photograph you really don't know what you're going to get until it's developed right because you you just you're shooting the negative and then you have to go get it processed somewhere you know unless you process process it yourself but most people didn't have access to the to the chemicals and the paper right to to make to make a glass negative or whatever they they use back then. This is in the this is in the nineteenth century. These little girls are doing this, and it's crazy. The, these photographs they were taking, you know, and people believed it because they right? had yeah. something like that before. So I chose that time period because I thought, well, if these fantastical things exist in the eighteen nineties, you know, you, you see this photograph, you can maybe believe it because back then they didn't have Photoshop, you know. Right, it's proof, so, actual proof, actual proof, you know. Um, yeah, now a video isn't even actual proof anymore, right? You no, can have a not. video of somebody saying something and it's a, a deep fake, yeah. you know? So oh, what yeah. a strange era to, to enter. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you think about video and you think about Rodney King, right? Like that's not fake because they didn't have technology back then to do that, to fake that. So that's really Rodney King getting beaten by cops. You know what I mean? So, right? Uh, right. So now now you could have somebody stand up and say, wait, that's fake. And whether it's fake or not, suddenly half the people in the world who want it to be fake will say, yeah, it's fake. What, and, what I find so crazy about the Rodney King thing is that uh, it's not like the, the guy had a phone. He's actually using a video camera. You know what video cameras look like back then? So yeah. He has, I mean, this, were... he has this big clunky thing in his hand and he's shooting this thing. And it's like, what? You know, so that, that that's that's like that's some effort. You know, not like now. You just whip out your cell phone. You're just like, oh, oh, that guy said a thing, and then it's yep. everywhere. You know, um, but even before, you know, um, I got into making these kinds of paintings. I was in art school, and I would go to the. I was. I went to Pratt. It was in Brooklyn, an art school. And it's the 1980s, 
And in the 1980s, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't even talk about a lot of the artists that, that, that are accessible on the internet today, you know, so I would have to discover it on my own in, the, in their archives in the library. But I, I would go into their, this, they, they had this amazing old library, right? And uh, famous for, for shooting, a, a <laughs> that there's like a porno movie was shot there, right? or so scenes from, uh, I guess it was, um, it was that, that Dallas Cowboys one, Debbie Does Dallas. Like, so, <laughs> I, 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 I think, from what I understand, there were some scenes that were shot at that library, which I think is pretty funny. Um, you know, little secret stuff. How did they talk the library into letting I, you do that? I don't that? know. Uh, I mean, they had, they had a film department, you know. Uh, so I guess, you know, back then, if you were in the film department, you know, uh, and you're shooting with film, you know, you could fake it, right? Because every, every art school had a film department, whether it was like NYU had, had a film department, you know, you get your little ID card, you go downstairs and you, you rent out the camera and you have a crew and you go, you know, shoot something. You know, I'm shooting this for class. You know, not 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 to be distributed on 42nd Street, but you know, for class, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, anyway, in that library, they had all these artists that I were discovering that I'd never heard of before that they didn't even mention in class because each generation of teachers, right? It's, um, I think art gets lost, right? Because you have, you have the, you have the famous artists that are in the, in the in textbooks. That's a key, really. You got to get in, got to get into an art history book. If you're not in the art history book, you'll be lost in time. It's, it's like, um, it's like Eddie Cantor. You know who Eddie Cantor is? Eddie mm -hmm. Cantor. He's a performer from uh, the silent era, from radio. And at one time, he was so popular, Eddie Cantor, that he even had a float in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, Eddie Cantor, right? Uh, and this guy, he was around forever. And a really, really famous guy, one of the most famous comedians in, in, in the world, uh, or actually in North America. Uh, but then, uh, just, just times change, the zeitgeist changes, people's interests change, and he got lost in time. Sadly, because a lot of his films weren't preserved, you know what I mean? Uh, they, maybe the technology was different back then. Luckily, we have the Laurel and Hardy movies over at Hal Roach Studios. They, like they saved those, but the ones that this guy was in are, are gone. So the only reason why I know who he is is because I was watching an episode of Boardwalk Empire. And on the show, Steve Buscemi's character has a friend named Izzy. And that is Eddie Cantor. And I was like, wait. And then I looked it up and then there's the guy. So I was like, oh, no kidding. So you can have this whole giant career and then just like, like that, gone, right? Artists are like that, painters are like that. You could be, you could be William Bouguereau. You could be the most famous French painter in 1875. And yet by the time 1950 rolls around, nobody knows who the hell you are. You're gone. Even though while he was alive, unlike as you say, Monet and Max Ernst and those guys, they were broke. This guy was not broke. These guys, this guy was rather wealthy. He was rather well off because he was really famous and, and people loved his work, but it got lost in time because, you know, the zeitgeist changes, people's interests changes. Right. Well, chances are, chances are he was one of those artists who knew how to do really well what was popular at the moment. Right. Right. He was not the first through the door with that idea. Yeah. And he's not going to be credited in the art history books for being that. But if you, if you know how to paint and you're a decent painter, it's sort of like... Um, there, there are certain people you look at for certain things. Like for him, this I always love the way he painted hands, right? Uh, he he had he had a knack. So there's something about the way his, the gesture is, right? He always knew what what pose to have perfectly for those hands. He's really good at painting hands and feet. Kind of crazy, right? Just like so, I look at his work for that. You know, not that his other the rest of his paintings aren't great. They are. They're kind of nice. There's a couple of his paintings uh, at, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There's there's one at the uh, uh, Sterling and Clark uh, Museum in Massachusetts. I guess, what is that? That's, uh, I forget what town that is, but that's in Massachusetts. Um, uh, way they, Western uh, Mass, uh, just south of uh, Pittsfield. Uh, yeah, the Clark. And, and, and the Pittsfield oh, Williamstown. Has, Williamstown. Williamstown. And, and the Pittsfield uh, Museum has two Bouguereau paintings in it as well. You know, but he's one of those guys that just got lost in time and that we didn't really you know, for whatever reason, you go to art school in the 1980s and the, the, the teachers don't even mention because they because they don't know about them. They've never heard of them. You know, they're busy talking about uh, 
whatever whatever is in the textbook. You know, that's just the way it is. So right, okay. So so what do you think makes the difference of who makes it into those books and who does it? Well, it's, it's not popularity. Some of it is, is marketing. You know, uh, we're 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 we've, we're reached an age where someone has to tell you that somebody has value it's in this history in that world. I, I, I hate to admit that, I hate to say that, but sometimes that's what it is, you know? Sometimes you look at something for face value and you, it's not necessarily all there, you know? It takes like a minute to, to you have to read a few paragraphs or something to describe what it is you're looking at. Context, you have to know the context. Context, um, exactly. exactly. Art history is all about context because right, right now we can, with our digital tools, uh, paint literally anything and make it look amazing. Right. And so now that it's completely wide open, something from 1950 might not look nearly so impressive right. until you understand the context that this blew some doors open, that, you know, it completely broke some conventions, that it opened eyes, that it, you know, created whole new worlds of possibilities, uh, that the current software wouldn't be possible without it. And then, then you understand why it has value. Well, uh, and, and with that, I would say that there, there were great painters before and there will be great painters after. That's just the way it is. You know, people come, people go, things work out. Sometimes you see something and, and there's a familiarity there and you go, ah, and then you can connect the dots. Um, I think of, well, one of the painters that you, know, you would ask me about, uh, his name is Vibert, he's a French painter. And he was alive around the same time that Bouguereau was alive. Uh, in fact, uh, he was born 15 years after and died two years before. Um, and this guy's work is really, he's like a, I, I would call him like a gag painter. His stuff is like really just kind of funny. I love, I love the idea of humor in paintings, you know? Um, there's one painting he did called The Diet, which is hilarious to me. It's about a, uh, it's- uh, Dave, that was the first one that I sent you. Yeah. And, and basically so you have this cardinal, right? And obviously he's on a diet and, and look at his face. He just, he's just so beaten down, right? And behind him, just beyond his, you know, you can hear there's a commotion back there and there's like a giant banquet being thrown. He can't eat any of that, you know? I look at the food they're bringing in, you know? And he's just sitting there with his little cup with this little biscuit. That's all he's got, you know? He's like, oh, if only, <laughs> if only I could go in there and eat with the Pope and he can't, you know? Uh, Cause he's on a diet and it's pretty funny stuff. But there's other ones, there's, uh, there's one where there's a guy who is, uh, is a cardinal and he's posing, it's called the, the preening uh, peacock. Uh, it's, yeah, if you pull up on that. And, you know, I'm obviously this guy's making fun of him. He has no idea. And then he bothers to put a peacock in the background to show you what this guy's doing. You know, it's like, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm so impressed with myself. Look at my, look, look upon me as I am standing before you with this wonderful uh, uh, presence of all this, these uh, accoutrements. Right. It ends up becoming yeah. a, uh, a painting about narcissism. Yeah, which is hilarious. I, I, I love this stuff. Now, Are you a Goya uh, fan at all? Uh, yes. Yes, I am. I, I love how Goya was, you know, his whole situation was he was well known. And he had become the flavor of the minute, even though he did absolutely endure in uh, art history. And if you were royalty, you would get painted by him. But he did not like royalty. And he did not paint them flatteringly at all. <laughs> yeah. He made them look like the piggies that they were. And, and they would look at the finished painting and say, oh, look how fine the draperies are. Look, you know, but the faces are just not the faces of good people. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I love it. I love And, you know, <laughs> and, that, and that's why, why I like uh, uh, Viber so much. Because boy, can he paint too at the same time. Not only is he a funny guy, but boy, that guy could paint like the devil. You know, this is pretty much uh, the height of what these guys can do in the 19th century as far as French painters go. You know, between him and Jerome and Cavanaugh and Bouguereau and all those guys, they all painted like this. Or, or some, met, some version of that, you know. Um, like a guy like uh, Jerome, you know, he was... Uh, he could paint really well. I, I, I never really liked the way he painted faces, but boy, that guy can, he could paint some stuff. Man, he, uh, if you look at his uh, or Orientalist paintings and some of the backgrounds are just kind of nuts. You know, there's so much going on. Not that one, but there's, there's other ones. That's kind of a lesser one. Um, but uh, he was, uh, he was something, Jerome. Uh, 
there's, there's, there's one of his at the Met, it's uh, Pygmalion and Galatea. And then of course, the other, the other big Jerome paintings that we're familiar with are the, all the gladiator paintings, the ones that uh, Ridley Scott was looking at before he made the movie Gladiator. Oh. You know, like thumbs down, I'm sure you've seen that painting, uh, where the, uh, I guess, uh, I, didn't, I didn't send it to you guys, so it's not part of the list of painting. Um, Gabe, well, Gabe can look it up. Just go to, uh, you type in uh, thumbs down and, and Jerome, and that'll, that'll come up. I'm sure you've seen the painting. I've got it up. I'm just trying to figure out how to do it. Oh, okay. Technology. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, I'm still not doing it right. Hold on. Still not doing it right. Hold on. I was going to say, that looks like a Paul Clay. <laughs> <laughs> there, there it is. Go. You know this painting. Yeah. And of course, there's some discussion of what that actually means, thumbs down. Does it mean kill him? Or does it mean keep, keep him alive? Does he deserve to die? Does he not deserve to die? What does that mean? Uh, <laughs> I, I know in the movies they always uh, they always have the thumbs up meaning that the guy lives, you know. But uh, I'm not so sure. Um, there's a lot going on in this painting. Look at all that. Yeah, Clowns. yeah. The, it, just, that, just that area in the upper left. Yeah. Massive. A lot. And it's wonderful. Um, there's a whole school of these painters in France at the time. I mean, him being one of them. Cavanaugh being another one. Uh, just. Wonderful, wonderfully skilled painters, but they, they had they they had a little something to say about about the time, and they they told it through other, uh, I guess, through their version of what they call historic paintings, right? Uh, then there's uh, uh, Alma Tadema, Alma Tadema. Do you know that that painter? I think I'm pronouncing it wrong. Uh, he was he painted a lot of these sort of Greek people uh, <laughs> celebrating. Big, big paintings, a lot of pageantry. And, uh, but, it, but it was very funny because if you look at the paintings, everybody just looked like a bunch of English people dressed up as, <laughs> as uh, you know, because you can't escape that. It's, it's like watching, uh, you know, uh, Spartacus and looking at Kirk Douglas's haircut, you know, you just kind of go, well, all right. I mean, that's, you know. <laughs> right, right. Escape, you well, know? you know, that's what makes the, the so-called Orientalist paintings of the time interesting. Yeah. And, and there were a few artists that, that you know, kind of went there because nobody had seen that stuff. You didn't have right. photos. You couldn't look at, you know, on the internet and see this stuff, right? Uh, and so it was very exotic looking, very different. And oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you could pretty much put anything you wanted in a painting and say, yeah, it's really like that there. They do have 40 foot elephants and people would have no reason to doubt you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, it was, it, it, that's, that's the thing about that, right? Because people just didn't travel. It wasn't, it wasn't possible, you know, uh, economically, you know? And uh, even just physically, you know, everything's by boat. It wasn't safe, right? Yeah, and that, this this painting's amazing. I saw that painting at the, the Louvre, and uh, the lighting in it is kind of remarkable, you know. Um, but I, I love I love this I, lo I love these sort of like gag painters, right? Uh, but that would make jokes. And even even today, I look at a lot of people that do that kind of work, you know, um, that work for the New Yorker. People like uh, Peter DeSev. Uh, he, he does covers for the New Yorker once in a while. And uh, I, I had just done some concept work for Netflix and he was one of the artists and I got to see his sketches, you know, in the production and, it, and all his stuff was just so vibrant and, and there was so much movement in his drawings. And, uh, but also they were very funny. They were just like, uh, like, <laughs> like he would take the notes and he would just draw these things and it was just, it was just the, 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 a, little, a little beyond, right? Uh, there's a guy right now, a, a, a character artist. His name is uh, Thomas Fluerty. I don't I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. But you can find him on Instagram. It's his last name. His last name is spelled F L U A R T. Fluerty. Maybe there's an H in there. Um, that guy's amazing, and he does these great uh, caricature portraits of, of 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 just about anything, uh, dogs, people, whatever. Guy, guy's fantastic. If I could. If I could share the screen, I could pull them up real quick if you want. Uh, you should be able to. I do have them. Oh, you, you got them? That guy. Oh, wow. I love his work. I think he's terrific. You know, just look at his drawings. <laughs> <laughs> look at those little hands. That's hilarious. 
Oh. And then his dogs. Look at his dogs. Oh, yeah, yeah. That guy's something else. Now, is this uh, actual paint we're That's seeing paint. here? He's a painter. Yeah, He's I always have to ask. Well, uh, you know, it's funny about that. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of these guys can paint, too. They don't just work digitally, you know. Uh, he could do it if he wanted to, I guess. Yeah. You know, if he, if he had to, you know. Sometimes they, they ask us for uh, an illustration. You want to do it quickly, and, you know, it's, it's not too easy to scan an oil painting. You know what I mean? Right. Minute. You, if you don't take a photograph of it first, you know. But it's true. This guy's drawing is just remarkable to, to be able to see all that. To, to know what, what parts are the parts you want to exaggerate, right? And it's pretty remarkable stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed by caricature artists. And, you know, I've, I've tried just like messing around with liquify and Photoshop on, on photos just to see if I can figure out where to exaggerate. And, you know, it's it's a thing that I think certain people just really have a knack for. Oh, yeah. And they could be so brutal. You know, they could pick the one <laughs> thing, the one thing that you hate the most about yourself. And that's the thing that they, you know, uh, like, oh, look at that nose. Uh oh, forget it. Now it's now it's a. It's a, it's a, it's a monolith on the, on the guy's face, you know, uh, you know, just. And then beautifully and, painted too, that stuff. It's oh yeah. Like, oh yeah. So between him and a guy named Jason Seiler, he's another one. That guy's kind of amazing. He just, he does pretty straight stuff too, though. He just did the, um, the, the Time Magazine uh, uh, portrait of uh, uh, Joe Biden and uh, K Kamala Harris, uh, that, that cover, that was his. And, uh, he, he's painted the uh, Time Magazine Man of the Year a few times. His name is Jason Seiler, who is a uh, great guy and uh, really, so, really talented. Here's a question, not, not yeah. to backtrack, but uh, I'm always curious about this because artists don't exist in a void. They, they have to have people paying them Oh yeah. Uh, to exist. And, you know, for example, the uh, artists you're talking about, they're contemporary, they're doing commission work for magazines and things like that so uh yeah incredible stuff but uh let's rewind to uh the 19th century french school of painters that we were just talking about uh -huh. who who were they painting for well who were their clients well it's a system right so you have uh you, you go you, you you find patrons it's all about finding patrons and the patrons pay for your work you do portraits of wealthy people or you know people of royalty that sort of thing if you're lucky uh you win one of these big competitions and then uh you could it's almost like getting a grant right uh just just to be accepted at one of these 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 academies was like a big deal you know you had to right. apply to being one it, was, it wasn't so easy you know you you uh you kind of had to be well read too not just a person who could paint well there's a lot a lot going on um and they're pretty much their their livelihood was these patrons. They made their money doing portraits for people, you know. Uh, right now, I, I I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, the pearl, a uh, girl with a pearl earring about Vermeer. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and, and it really shows the relationship between the artist and the patrons at the time. Because if you end up with one major patron who is most of your livelihood, um, it ends up being a pretty uncomfortable situation. Uh, oh yeah. And. You know, it's it's much better to diversify and have a whole bunch of patrons. You know, and of course, tattooers are, are a good example of that. Um, I mean, that's the plan, but, uh, right? That's the plan. You want to yeah, right. want to be able to diversify, but not everybody was uh, fortunate to have multiple, multiple, you know, uh, high roller kind of uh, patrons. You know, there there are. Well, okay, patrons, and, then, you know, and then the kind of patrons you have end up shaping the kind of work you do. So let's move over to Maxfield Parish. Right now, I love Parrish. Uh, I think that, you know, technically speaking, visually speaking, his stuff is just spectacular. And I also uh, think it's really cool how he would actually build uh, models in his garage at these mountain ranges or buildings and things like that, create photo references for himself so that he could oh, yeah. really oh. nail this stuff. Very, very well thought out in terms of his projects. His lighting, I mean, look at this lighting, right? Um, oh, yeah. But he's not really regarded as a fine artist. He is a quote unquote illustrator because he did these paintings for, you know, whatever, general electric catalogs and, or, or calendars and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, and somehow he is the, the person doing, capable of doing these paintings 
is somehow not considered a fine artist. You won't see his stuff in the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, how the fuck did that? Well, it, it's it's because of the uh, whoever's in charge, right? Whoever whoever is on the shoulders of art, art historians past and has decided that this guy isn't isn't one of us. You know, he's not one of he's not a fine artist or whatever. Uh, I I think that's a mistake. You know, if if you think about what what he did, it, it's a it's a it's a wonderful uh, connection to a moment in time, right? Uh, and also with his work, it's very, it's nothing looked like that. He was the only right. one whose work will even look like that to begin with. Just on that alone, I, would, I think he deserves a look, you know, or some merit. Uh, I think it's a mistake for people to just scoff at it so quickly. But, you know, it, it was, a, it was the, the times, you know, because modern art was here at that point. So we're, we're talking like the 1930s happened, right? So, right. Meanwhile, his work, Norman Rockwell's work, are known by far more people. They're, you know, hanging up on people's walls in, a, in millions of American homes. Definitely a lot more uh, consumed by a lot more eyeballs than the, uh, the museum artists. But somehow they just don't get to be in the Pantheon. Well, with him, he happened to be doing the covers of the Saturday Evening Post, which was everywhere, you know, and, and, and all these publications. So he... He became a pretty, even while he was alive, he was a pretty famous artist. People knew who he was, you know. Um, and, 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 and for a long time, too. His career, is, he had a long career with Rockwell. I mean, he was, he was a high-level illustrator uh, from the 1920s till the 1960s. He just kept going. That's a long yep. run, man. You know, 40, 40 plus years of just him painting these things, you know. And uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't hurt him that he painted those four freedoms to, to get war bonds during World War II. So that, that, that raises your profile. You're helping the country, right? You're helping the war effort. So yeah, he's, uh, he's something else known Rockwell. Yeah. And he worked like the devil. I don't know too many painters that made as many paintings as, as he painted. You know? I yeah, mean, he's just got an incredible catalog of work. Because he just worked nonstop. You know, he just never stopped. On even the holidays, his wife, his poor wife, was like, "You got to come down. You got to get out of your studio." And he's like, "No, no, I gotta, gotta keep painting, you know." But it, it was tough for, for you know. I, I remember there there was a, a show of his, a big retrospective, and it was at one of the uh, modern art museums in New York. And you know, a lot of people kind of turned their nose up at it because it wasn't, you know, Kandinsky. You know what I mean? Uh, but I, I think it, in terms of, of history, it's important. It's important to recognize what was around, what was going on, you know? Uh, it was the closest thing to a, a genre painting, right? In, in, in the United States that everybody knew, right? Uh, was Norman Rockwell, you know? There's, there's certain iconic images of painters that people know because they're, they're famous images, whether it's um, uh, American Gothic, you know, the, uh, the uh, the, the painting with the, with, with the farmer and the pitchfork and his wife, you know, uh, that, you know, every, everybody knows that painting, you know, or, 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 or that uh, James Montgomery flag version of uh, 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 Uncle Sam, I want you. Everybody knows oh, that. that. Yeah. You know, we all know that painting. Everybody, you see it, you go, oh yeah, I know that painting. You know, it's just, some things have a lot of traction, you know, uh, they just, everybody knows that, Uncle Sam, you know, really famous painting, you know, oh. Right. So sometimes you get lucky and you survive like your, your, your stuff survives the test of time. And people know who you are and, and it keeps going, you know, but a lot of these other painters, not so much. You have to learn about them in school. You know, I mean, the, my, my art, my, my art history textbook didn't even have Gustav Klimt in it to give you an idea of what, thing, what was going on. And now, of course, everybody knows who he is. Right. And in, in, in art school, like they would tell you about Gustav Klimt. But in, in 1985, not so much, you know, uh, it's just it's one of those things, right? Yeah, well, you know, some of these artists, they, they struggled to get recognized outside of their illustration career. And, uh, and of course, Klimt had a very specific style, you know, nobody oh, else yeah. looked oh, like him. Right. Um, but, it, you know, it, it, if you, you know, made your money commercially, and then tried to step away and do something different. Uh, people just didn't seem to care about it. Uh, you know, Art Nouveau uh, 
um, was became uh, Muka's known thing so much that when you know towards the end of his career he uh, did this uh, epic series of uh, what were the the Czech uh, uh, what was it the Slav epic Slav epic. epic right when he uh, did those pieces you know most people could care less uh, it's not what he's known for and they're incredible paintings uh, Have you ever get to see them in person Slav the epic Gabe okay, it's S L A V uh, but uh, uh, Muka M U C H A and these yeah. are gigantic things. Right, look, yeah, yeah. Look I mean, at that photograph. Big. Click on any of those, you'll see the, I mean, that's, look at that. Look how big yeah. he is of the thing, right? Yeah. Amazing. And, you know, as, as an illustrator, he was cranking out, you know, again, like Rockwell, vast quantities of stuff, you know, iconic things. And, you know, his stuff has definitely survived uh, in our culture. You know, his, you know, job cigarette girl is as well known as Uncle Sam. Uh, yeah. But no, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely that's definitely uh, uh, he gets style points for that. I mean, there were there were other uh, Art Nouveau guys before him, uh, but they didn't quite have the, what he had. This right. about the energy in his line, uh, you know, there's, there's all it's all these curvilinear shapes that he had, you know. But it was because he was just such an overall capable artist that he was oh, yeah. able to, yeah. you know, reduce it down to this very graphic thing. But that wasn't really where his heart was. No, that those that those Slav epic paintings are, are, are they're like monsters. They're really amazing. Uh, one of these days, I'll get to go over there, and you know, of course, the way things are right now, I gotta wait a little bit. But uh, I do want to eventually go. I think those they're in Prague. I think that's where those paintings are, right? Uh, the they they had a couple of them here in in, in Massachusetts about ten years ago. Uh, I believe it was at the Wooster Museum. They did a retrospective of Alphonse Mocha and Master, and I just missed it. You know, for whatever reason, I just didn't get get up there. And, it, it was, and they were, they were, I think they had one panel from the pro, from the Slav epic there. It would've been kind of cool to see that, you know? Yeah, I, I imagine it's gotta be nerve wracking to transport paintings like that overseas. How, how would you, right? How would you right. transport that? It's gigantic, it's old, it's, you know, you've gotta make a crate the size of a, a mobile home. To, to ship it, right. and uh, yeah, that would, that would scare me. But uh, at the same time, it's amazing that people can see this stuff. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Someday I'll have a studio big enough where I can make big paintings like that. Uh, <laughs> that's you know, the problem with big paintings is then what do you do with them when you're done? Exactly. What do you do with it? unless you sell it to somebody? What do you do with it? What yeah. You... Well, I mean, like I've got a couple of big ones that uh, you know, one of. Uh, uh, Gabe's clients has got hanging up in their in their business because they've got a big enough lobby. It's like, right. we gotta, we gotta put them somewhere, you know? Uh, so I've kind of all but stopped doing big paintings, you know, for actually for a while now. And I feel like since I've done that, I've become a lot more critical of myself as an artist. I feel like I have to get way better before I can go back to a big canvas like that, if that makes sense. Well, the, the other thing about big paintings is uh, it's good for our eyes. You know, as I'm getting older, I got to wear glasses now. You know, it's, it's harder to work on little, little things. So it's like yeah. painting, it's all big marks. It's a little, it's a little different. I, you know, there's, there's viewing distance. I could, I could step away eight feet, you know, and, you know, I could see stuff. You can be loose. Yeah. yeah. You, could, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot harder, you know, to do the little paintings when, you know, when, the, when the eyes start to go. So lenses everywhere, you know. I look like a guy that, that uh, when I'm working, I look like a guy that makes a fake ID that has so many lenses on me. I'm just like, look at all this stuff. You know? Yeah. Um, Are you familiar with this uh, painter named John Berkey? He's a sci-fi yep. illustrator. Okay. I know John Berkey. Yeah. I, 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 I spoke to him on the phone about nine years ago. There was okay. uh, oh, amazing. I was putting together a, a, a sci-fi show at, at, at the Rock the Room Gallery in Seattle, and he was one of the artists I, I contacted. It was uh, it was John Berkey. It was. Um, Gosh, who's the other guy that, uh, it was, uh, there was, you know, Jim Gurney, because I know him, he lives right in my town. So nice. You get a hold of James Gurney, you know, the dinosaur guy. And then, yeah, I, and then I love the his usual. post because everything that Gurney posts is educational and helpful. It's, he's yeah. really amazing that way. Oh, he, he has a lot of knowledge. Uh, whenever, it's funny, I, I, sometimes I'll be in the middle of my class in New York and, I, and I'll be like, oh, I've got something. Who would know? And then I call up James Gurney. I just call him up on the phone, and he has the answer. 
And then he, and he tells me and the class, oh, it was this, you know, and it, which is great because he knows all about methodology too, which is very interesting. Yeah, he's got a method for everything. It's like, do you oh. want to do a nighttime scene? Uh, hang on one second. I do want to just uh, say the, the Norman Rockwell Museum also is uh, in Western Mass. So between the Clark and the Rockwell Museum, uh, Western Mass is pretty amazing for doing field trips with, even for oh, yeah. people like me that don't know much. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, unfortunately, I have to quit the call and come back because I've just lost my sound. It's just going to take me a second. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, and yeah, James Gurney is definitely uh, oh, he's great. a big influence. Uh, <laughs> he's, 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 he's great. He's a great painter. Yeah. You know, um, Do you remember when the uh, comic me book museum was in uh, Northampton? No, I don't remember that at all. It was probably like ten years ago. Eastman and Laird, or Eastman or Laird, uh, got it together, and uh, it was a full-on, you know, comic illustration museum in uh, right in Northampton, right in downtown here. Yeah, I I'd like, heard I'd heard about I heard that he lived there or something like that. Like Kevin Eastman lived. Yeah, in. they had a heavy metal or the publishing company or some such. Uh, they had wow. a pretty strong roots here. Yeah. Hey, I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, the reason I had mentioned John Berkey and uh, Gabe, that's uh, B-E-R-K-E-Y, uh, is uh, the double mirror system that, uh, that he used for a lot of his stuff. Travis, are you familiar with that? The double mirror system? He was, a lot of, a lot of his paintings, he's got a mirror behind his head on the yep. ceiling. Uh -huh. Another one on the wall in front of him. So he's actually looking at that much of the time while he's painting. It allows okay. him to be 10 feet away from his painting wow. while he's working. And so there's this, uh, let's pull up a couple more. There's this great energetic looseness to it uh, that uh, I have to, I can pull up a couple kind of, of these closer. Well, I, I always love this stuff. He would, he would paint these spaceships and it's full of material, but when you get up close, it's just a couple of marks. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he was the guy that painted the impressionist spaceship, is what he's called. The impressionist. Huh, yeah. Guy. yeah. Yeah. It was terrific. It was like if, if Sargent painted spaceships, this is what they would look like. Right. And then when, when I heard about the mirror thing, I was like, ah, okay, okay, I get that, it. That makes Cause, sense, right? Because then no. you're only seeing the big shapes. Because oh. viewing distance is based on, right? Like the bigger shapes is what you see first, not the detail. So if you if you're stepping away from something, right, and you're you're 15 feet away from something, what do you see first? The big shapes, the big values, the big the big uh, temperature changes. You see these big things first, not the tiny little details, right? And that that helps them not get bogged down on it, which is great. Yeah, and I think that that's you know especially being you know tattooers are notorious for it. I always struggle with it. It's like where do you not put the detail? Where do you keep it loose? And how do you even keep it loose if it's not like natural to you? And uh, you know, one, one thing I do when I'm painting these days is I haven't gone smaller than a half inch brush in a while. And I'm just forcing myself to do everything with that. Uh, and so it limits the resolution in a way that it has been helpful for me. Yeah, so have you, have you been looking at uh, Dean Cornwell at all? I'm not familiar with Dean. Let's, Dean let's Cornwell, check him out. Dean Cornwell paintings. Uh, he's one of the guys that, that Gurney really is. Uh, admired uh, okay. uh he's a golden age illustrator golden age uh, so we're talking like 1930s 1940s uh dean the dean of illustrators dean cornwell uh, okay is, is, i don't know if gabe is looking that up right now or, uh, yeah no when i think of the golden age of illustrators i think of nc wyatt are we in the right period here hold on a second nc wyatt is just before dean cornwell okay Sorry. That's okay. Oh, now I'm all over the place here. I have so many things pulled up now. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little yeah, lost. Yeah, got to start closing <laughs> some windows. Yeah, and the, the, there you have another, another interesting comparison is N.C. Wyeth and then Andrew Wyeth. Uh, you know, and Andrew Wyeth's style and technique is almost illustrative but he marketed himself differently and is seen as a fine artist, not an illustrator. Well, he did I don't think he wanted to do what his dad was doing anyway. Very yeah, much, oh, not at all. Really a totally different approach to art. Um, 
definitely didn't want to do what his dad was doing. There, there's there's some there's some pretty great YF painting, uh, Andrew YF paintings, uh, and there's some pretty great NC YF paintings. A lot of a lot of movement, a lot of action in, in, in uh, NC paintings. These are uh, these these are quieter. The ones that uh, you know they they're sort of a. Uh, I love this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're not nearly as illustrative just in their uh, their action, their intent. Uh, mm -hmm. You know what's being told. Uh, there might be some sense of okay, there's a tension between these two characters, uh, but it's not going to be like you know when something is an illustration. Generally, they're you know illustrating a scene from uh, a story or something very specific like that. Oh, I mean that's that's clearly one of the one of the differences. I, one of my favorite paintings from him is the, I guess, the old, old Man Winter. Like there's like a, this is like a man in the snow. Uh, I think I get, maybe got the title of the painting wrong. It's, uh, oh, there, there it is, I think that's it. Uh, click on that one there. Um, yeah, if there's a better image of that, but. This top one? Huh? Yeah. That, that one right there, yeah. Look at that thing. Yeah. And obviously that is a fanciful interpretation, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and why, you know, where where is it that one artist who does this is allowed to be a fine artist and another would do the same thing and be uh, branded as an illustrator? Well, again, it's it's up to it's up to these uh, it's up to the talking heads that's the <laughs> <laughs> that control the 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 art the art the art market and, and tell you what something is and what something is and that which is it's unfortunate that that we've come down to that. Um, I, I think it's a mistake. I, I think all art is up to interpretation, and I think that you know just what makes art great or what makes art connect to a person uh, isn't necessarily based on the intention that the artist had when they made the painting or, or made the art. It's, it's, it's after that. So just because Maxwell Parrish made a painting called Daybreak or, or, or made paintings for Edison Mazda, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that that's not, you know, great art or that, you know, because, because the purpose was different, you know. I could find many artists that make things that are fine art that the paintings are just terrible because they're just terrible paintings. That doesn't make that doesn't change the quality of a painting, uh, what what it's used for, you know. Uh, it, it, intention is, is irrelevant in terms of face value, really, right? I mean, if you, I I, I always I always go to the garage sale test, you know, like if you, you you go to a garage sale and down down the street, and there's a bunch of things laid out, and uh, there's some paintings there, and you go, oh, you look at the paintings. There's a, there's a certain kind of painting where you look at it and you, and you just go, I know that Aunt, Aunt Zelma did this painting when she was in high school and this, you know, or I know that this is that thing they did with the nail and the, and the, and the string, with all the nails. I'm sure you've seen that. Or, or this, yeah. th this was done in shop class with the, with the plexiglass and all the fishing line, right? Uh, that this, like, you just know when you look at it, but then there'll be this one painting and you're like, wait, look at this thing. What was that? And you go, oh, I know that was used for an ad. So you had an illustrator in your family that must have done this. And there's a certain quality in the so that's the garage sale test, right? You look at something, you can see what it is. Now, a lot, a lot of art that hangs in galleries might not pass the garage sale test. Like you might not, you might look at it and you might not think it's art. You know what I mean? Because it, it it's not in a room with a with a white wall, you know? Because because what you've done is you've taken away the context. You know, some art does not is not transferable. The context is not transferable from place from location to location, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And well, that, rest assured, if we saw either of your artworks in a garage sale, we'd buy them up immediately because they fucking are awesome. Oh, thanks. That's very nice of you to say. Uh, but but it would look like, you know, my, my stuff would look like somebody must have done this for something, for somebody. You know, that's what it looks like. You know? Basically, seeing it outside of the gallery context, like it's just in this, this humble setting of a garage sale. And you're just looking right. at it in that context. Exactly. Uh, yeah, what, what do you see then? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting way of, of filtering art. And, uh, you know, some of it you might look at and, and just say, holy shit, I have to buy this. 
But right. then some, which might actually be worth $60 million, might be like, yeah, it looks like this is where they clean their brushes. Right, right. Well, I, again, it, it context, like as you say, is everything, right? So if you, okay, right now at the, at the Dia Center in, or Dia Center in Beacon, New York, there is a pile of glass, just a pile of glass. Now, if you saw that pile of glass at a construction site in Hoboken, New Jersey, you wouldn't think other than hey, it's just a pile of glass because it's in this museum, right? The context is different. That's all. Now, I'm not saying it's bad art or anything. I'm just saying it's the context is not, right? Right, right, yeah. Take, taking this thing, taking a shark and slicing it up and displaying it in a museum makes it not a medical study of a shark, but a piece of art. Right, right. Uh, oh, you, that's like the, the sensation show in Brooklyn. Remember that? That's, I don't know if, I, uh, if I'm familiar with that that's one. A, I think Damien Hurst had these uh, giant, he had like a things in case. Uh, was yeah, it, well, the, the piece I was just talking about was, yeah. was Damien Hurst, yeah. Yeah, well, he had a couple of pieces like that at the show. And uh, it was kind of a big deal because, you know, there was a couple of things that, that upset people because, not because of what they were, but because of the title of the piece that upset people. Mm -hmm. It might not even have actually been the thing they said it was, you know. One, one, the, the, you know, just because you say that it's, you know, uh, elephant dung and this and that doesn't mean it actually is. That's just, you just wrote that on a piece of paper. That doesn't really mean, it may have been, I don't know, it could be, but that, that offended people, I guess. I, I, nothing worth, art shouldn't offend you. It's really not, you know. Yeah, but some artists set out to, and you know, yeah. it, there's no, no law saying that we shouldn't be allowed to. No, uh, I, I, I think that, um, that that's uh, it's up it's up to the artist what they want to do now whether or not you know people like it or whether that's something else but you know maybe that does it work does it get their attention it's a lot harder now you know you have to do more outrageous things to really get grab somebody's attention that okay way. well so just yeah. to bring this around full circle back to Travis Louie right what is it that you want people to experience what are you hoping they'll experience when they look at your art. Well, I, I like to tell these stories with these paintings. So I hope that, you know, when people look at them, uh, you know, sometimes it's more decorative, like those fish, it's more decorative. That's really more decorative than it's something I just felt like doing. But also it's a, it's an homage to my dog who passed away. Uh, that that dog fish on the top is actually my dog who died in July. Oh. So oh. I gotta put him in there, you know? I want to put him in something. So I, I, yeah. I you know, I'll just put him, and you're like, why a fish painting? Because it's a place that he couldn't go. You know, so that's why it, it's tough from a line drawing. Just imagine what this will look like as a painting. If you know what my paintings look like. Just, oh, yeah, yeah. That, so it, right now, it's going to be some hours. Yeah, it's going to be some time, right? Uh, like this I did for uh, the, uh, the poster nutbags. And they, they, uh, they are a group that uh, I guess they, how do I explain? They collect uh, rock posters, most of them. So there, there, there is, uh, there's a little, there are a couple of things in here that say something about the band Fish that happen to be in this painting. Uh, I guess, I guess you'd have to be a fan of Fish to know. Well, yeah, but it's, it's also kind of cool how you can hide these obscure references in the paintings and, uh, you know, they can work just as a decorative element, but if you happen to be in the know, it's like an Easter egg. But the, the art director for that, I mean, that's what she wanted, you know. Uh, and then, oh, that's just me doing my handwriting. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, you know, I remember back in the album cover days, there were a couple times I made the mistake of, of just adding stuff that I felt like adding, uh, mm -hmm. you know, hidden things. And yeah, they'd send them back and say, I need you to remove this. Oh, yeah. No, they, the art directors are very specific. Okay, look, this is what I want. I'm, I'm paying you to do this thing, right? And then this is all the paintings from last year. I just thought when I, I saw them all together, it reminded me of a yearbook. Mm -hmm. I just, I just, so I just, that's everything that you did on uh, in paint last year? Last year, yeah. It's all last year's painting. A lot of paintings last year. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep plugging away, plugging away. That's, that's what you do, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you know, I, I think that people ask, how, how do you succeed as an artist? And, you know, of course, that's the big one, you know, just keep working at it. But do you have any, any closing advice for any artists that might be watching that are just, uh, you know, I mean, we've talked about 
you know, the different levels of relative success of be, being pigeonholed, being, a, you know, known only as an illustrator, all these things. And, and uh, I guess it's hard to ensure your career against those things, but uh, you seem to be walking that line, you know. Uh, I, I still I still do illustration work every now and again. I get oh yeah call. yeah, but you, you're definitely like I think I think you've avoided being pigeonholed because uh, you know there's not a genre that you can firmly pin you into. Well, I, I just I, I would tell people just to follow their what what they want to do, uh, be cognizant of the world that they live in, you know, pay attention to what's around you, and try to absorb as much information as you can. You know, we we as artists we are products of our time, right? And our work is informed by the past. So don't be afraid to look behind you and see what, where, where you came from. And you might find more things to learn. You know, when you look at our artists before, even the artists that you're looking at now, you think, oh, that's amazing. And then oh, there's more because you can connect the dots. It goes back, it goes back. And that's kind of wonderful, you know? And uh, a lot of my paintings when I first started were inspired by movies. Uh, particularly uh, German expressionist and uh, uh, film noir, you know, these black and white pictures from the 40s, you know, mm -hmm. lighting, right? So, I mean, when I first time around, I was doing paintings of uh, chickens as gangsters. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? Uh, I, I couldn't sell a thing, you know, back then. I probably could sell them now, but I, I don't want to do that now, you know? Right. Um, just whatever influences you, don't, don't be afraid. Just keep going, keep looking, keep, keep making. Always keep making and everything will be fine. Or, be the best filter you can be. Exactly. Exactly. Right? Nice. That that's all you guys, right? That's everybody. You tattoo artists, anybody that makes, you know, makes art of any kind. You're absorbing all these things, right? You know? A little harder for you guys though, I think, because you have to deal with people who want certain things, right? Maybe. Yeah, but I think that when you're at it long enough and yeah. your clients earn your trust you start to be able to reach this, this nice in-between place where they're, they're giving you enough of a suggestion where you get a, a, a light bulb go, goes off. Ah. Like, yes, I want to do that. Now that I've seen this idea, I want to do it. And, and they, they know you well enough that they can throw you the right ideas. And in a perfect world, and I believe I'm one of the privileged that's in this situation, they come to you with ideas that are great because they understand you in ways you might not. And, and that's, so that's the best when people seek you out because there's a specific look that your work has and then they could again sort of connect the dots with it and then they and they trust you and let you do your interpretation of something but they might have seen you do one of these and one of these and they'll say but what if you were to do one of these with one of these and you'd be yeah. like i hadn't thought of that but that would be brilliant and so yeah. that's one of the things I, I love about tattooing but when i paint i don't want anybody's suggestions at oh, all really that's okay. my place for <laughs> You know, just yeah. just running. Uh, unless unless but, somebody uh, hires you, so doesn't anybody hire you once in a while to do that too? Like every every round again, you get someone who goes, "I want a thing." And I guess it's up to you whether you want to do it or not, right? Yeah, you know, not really. I don't really get a lot of commissions, and I don't know if I would want that because uh, I, I think that I start to doubt myself. Uh, you know, I was reading about how how H.R. Giger had at one point stopped letting people see his works in progress because. They'd see him and say, ooh, 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 I want to buy that. And the minute he had somebody who was a, a purchaser, he couldn't work on it anymore because every single brush stroke was like, is this what they want? Ah, uh, yeah, I see what you're you know? and, and all of a sudden, the whole intent behind doing the pieces has been kind of corrupted a little bit. Uh, and I know that doesn't, it doesn't work that way for everyone, uh, but as it, as a tattooer, I'm super fortunate that I can have a place where uh, I can filter all of that out and, and just, you know, cause, cause I have some things that are lined up in front of me. It happens. You get ideas. Uh, I don't ever run out of ideas. Uh, and it's just a matter of, okay, I've got time coming up. Which of these ideas do I want to you know steer myself towards? Uh, so it's not like I, I, desire that kind of input the way that uh i do with tattooing with tattooing i thrive off of it but you know it's part of part of the pendulum the creative pen pendulum of really needing to care about what the world thinks and working with them and learning from that 
and then swinging away from that and going deep into yourself and finding what you love and, and exploring that as much as you can. Well, it's nice to have that, that kind of an audience though, right? I mean, you get you to have people sure. out there, you know, um, I, I, I get to this point sometimes where, and this happens to other people, obviously, where they, they just want you to do your greatest hits. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and I, I get it. You know, I, I, there's musicians that, that you know, that, that, have, that fight to play that song over and over again. But, you know, you got to love it, I guess. So, you know, I, I remember watching uh, an interview with somebody and it was, it was Avril Levine. Remember her? Uh, oh, yeah. She was complaining about a song, about, about singing the song. And then, and then I... I don't remember if she corrected herself later and said, you know what, it's what the fans want. So you just do it. And, it, you know, now I, maybe she's is older now. So maybe, you, you know, but when you're young, you, you don't really, you know, you just kind of have this thing in your head, you know, where you, know, you think, oh, this is, you know, this is how it's supposed to be. But then as you get older, you go, oh, maybe not so much. You know, maybe uh, it's, yeah. okay. it's okay to do or, it. Or if you, if you experience a, a high level of success early on, you might make the mistake of thinking that, everything that you do is going to be met that same way and it won't necessarily. Well, that, that happens too. I've seen people do that. I've seen artists where they just can't take something and they keep going with it. And then eventually people get tired of it or, 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 or it doesn't connect for some reason or, or just some, something just doesn't work some, somewhere. And then they just make adjustments because that's what we've been doing. We're always making adjustments, right? Um, you have to adjust with, with the, the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist is cruel. It just, it's always traveling, always moving around. It is. And, and, you know, Sometimes um, it can make a, a shift overnight. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. You, you have to either be ready for that shift as an illustrator, or you have to be resilient enough with your vision as an artist to where you can still produce something that's going to you know, be appreciated within that context. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, and it happens with everything. Right, uh, painting, music too. Right, I mean, uh, there's this. You get to a certain point where maybe they don't hire this guy anymore because his film scores always sound like that. I mean, you want to get somebody yeah. else, so maybe a different sound, you know. And then yeah. they, they have to adjust, right? Even though obviously they 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 know how to write stuff and they could make anything really, but they get pigeonholed because they they've done too many scores that sound like that. Right, right. You end up in a rut, and I think that as artists we have to let ourselves. Uh, you know, explore outside of our, our comfort zones. I think that that's a real unfortunate thing for, for an artist is to get too deep into comfort zone, especially if you have clients that are paying you to stay there. Yeah. Uh, you, you start to lose happens. your edge. And then, you know, when it, when it becomes necessary to explore outside of it, it might just not come naturally. It might be a struggle. Oh, yeah. Which is why I'm drawing these fish now. And I'm going to make fish paintings for a little while, which is very nice. Well, than before, you know, it's just, you just, you know, you move with what, where it takes you, right? So hopefully, hopefully people like it. Who knows? I have no idea where it's going to go, but we'll see. You know, you never can know. And it's kind of nice not to. Yeah. Well, it's better that way. I think, I think if you, if you know too much ahead, that's not good. Um, just to interject real quick, speaking of people uh, liking things, I'm going to read off. Do you mind? Is now a good time to read off some of the comments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm about to, yeah. To, to wrap it up. So, yeah, let's, Perfect. let's uh, hear from our audience real quick. I'm going to try to go uh, pretty quick with some of these. Uh, Russell McLean says, dope. Uh, Pedro Simao says, hi, guys. Sean Fernandez, howdy, with claps. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Elvis Marura. Uh, Ray Alvia says, Mark Bodie. He was, uh, I guess, when you guys were going through the illustrators, the uh, Mark Bodie came up. Uh, Martin's Martin Treff, I can't pronounce Slova Slovakian names very well, but Martin says hello from Slovakia with claps. We've got uh, hello from New York, Pennsylvania, respect from Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi, that's from uh, David and Jim. Uh, Patty Simpkins, I think this might be for you guys. Hello, we know each other. I used to do massages at the tattoo conventions. Uh, Bob Montaga, Montagas, I can't pronounce, Montagna's friend. Uh, Eric Clark says, uh, dang, I've got to run off to my appointment. Thank you, guys. This was really interesting. Uh, Michelle says, hi. We've got, uh, oh, Vaquero Cruz uh, in Spanish says, I'm a fan of yours from Pueblo, Mexico. And then, oh, I have many of magazines. Uh, they all, the same person has many magazines. Uh, Bruno is uh, sending claps and smiley faces. Godex says, saludos a todos. Oh, I think I know enough Spanish. That means uh, hello to everyone, I think. Uh, Edgar says hello, everyone. And then uh, last up, uh, Jin uh, says hi, everyone. Edgar says hi. Shamrock, Shamak, 
says hello everyone uh regards from the uk so good time for this conversation in my life and uh, there's others but rest assured people loved it thank you very much all right hey thank you everyone for tuning in uh all right. We're going to be doing this regularly. Travis, thank you. This has been fascinating. Right. And actually, we're, we're going to try to make a point when we uh, do the final edit of this to uh, uh, collect all the names that you and I mentioned during this and when we uh, repost the video, have that list of names. So anybody wants to uh, dive deeper into researching any of this stuff, because I know we kind of skipped around really fast there, but you know, it's a lot of ground yeah. covered. Uh, and somebody uh, mentioned uh, Mark Baudet, right? So that's like, uh, is that that's uh, Cheech Wizards and Cobalt yeah. 60. Yep. His oh. dad, uh, uh, Vaughn was his dad. Vaughn, He's uh, Vaughn actually Vaughn a tattooer. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to make sure that th those names are all available to people because, uh, you know, it's, it's so much ground to cover. You could you could lose days just, you know, exploring their websites. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, we'll be back for uh, another art uh, history conversation in two weeks with, with Gunnar. Uh, thank you, Travis, so much for, for tuning right. in. And uh, yeah. if you ever feel like joining us for any of our other uh, online stuff. And if you ever feel like uh, leading a, a quick, uh, like a one hour sketch workshop, uh, anything like that, we'd love to have you again. Sure thing, you bet. Thanks man, right. thanks for having me. And thanks awesome again. Sure thing. No problems, I'm just gonna, uh, if you've been watching to the end, please check out the Reinventing the Tattoo app. Uh, you can find it on either of the app stores or just go to community.reinventingthetattoo.com and Travis does have stuff for sale. If you go to travislouis.com, I believe there's, I know there's prints, books, probably some originals, but uh, either way, go to travislouis.com and then guyacheson.com and we will catch up with everyone in the future. All right.